Good morning, and thank you for joining us here today for virtual worship at Faith Lutheran Church. Today we are celebrating the Festival of the Holy Trinity. Today we remember that we have a triune God. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one God. And today, specifically, we're reminded that our triune God has put his name on us. Our triune God has adopted us into his family, and now he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. May God bless your worship this morning. We begin in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. We pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit, and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. In mercy, cleanse our hearts and lips that, free from doubt and fear, we may ever worship you. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. For 1,500 years... God's people were found in one group, Israel. They had been selected out of all of the people of the world to be the ones through whom God was going to carry out his work of salvation. He had chosen them to bring the Messiah, the Savior, into the world. And for 1,500 years, if the world wanted to know about the true God, they had to come to Israel. But now, that was all going to change. It was time for the true God to reveal himself to the whole world, to the people outside of Israel. Instead of people coming to Israel to learn about the true God, the message was going to go out to them. And so on a mountainside in Galilee, Jesus appeared to his disciples and gave a command. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is how God was going to put his name on his people. This is how God put his name on you. But you know, before Jesus gave that command to go and make disciples, there were still some among his followers who had reservations. Matthew's Gospel tells us, when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. But the Bible, it doesn't say exactly what these followers of Jesus were doubting. Maybe they doubted that this really was Jesus standing in front of them. Or I suppose maybe they had doubts, some hesitations about Jesus being who he said he was, the, the Son of God. But if either of those two things are the case, I don't find it very likely that 
this group of disciples, of Jesus' followers, that they would have traveled all the way from Jerusalem up to a mountainside in Galilee to meet Jesus there. No, I think that when it says some doubted, their doubt was something more like uncertainty. Because Jesus had told them at other times that eventually he was going to return to heaven. Since the time Jesus left the grave, he had only been appearing to his followers on certain occasions instead of being with them all the time like he had been the last three years. They were starting to come to grips with the fact that they weren't going to be able to see Jesus standing next to them all the time anymore. So as they were walking to that mountain, as they saw Jesus appear before them, they wondered to themselves, what comes next? Don't you and I have that same question sometimes? When we look at the world around us, when we're struggling with something in our own lives, we can find ourselves asking, what comes next? After all, we can't see Jesus standing next to us. You know, sometimes we wish that Jesus would just swoop in and make everything right in an instant. That's why what Jesus says next is so important and such a comfort for us. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus wants to remove the doubt and the hesitancy. He wants us to understand that as we go through life, we aren't going alone. Jesus hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't forgotten about us. He doesn't let us slip through the cracks. That's the confidence that Jesus gave his disciples as he sent them out into the world. He assured them that all things were under his control, and now it was time for others to know that too. So these followers of Jesus were being sent to make more followers of Jesus, to make more disciples. And Jesus told them how they were going to do that, how disciples are made. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And that's what followers of Jesus have been doing since that day, going out and making disciples of all nations through baptism and through teaching. And that's really important for us to remember today, too. Because we can be tempted to just sit back and think that people, well, they know where we are. So if they want to hear the message of the Bible, the message of Jesus, the message of the true God, well, then they can just come to us. But what Jesus says is, go. Don't expect them to come to you. Don't wait for them to come to you. And then, as you go, go with confidence because we're going out with Jesus' power, Jesus' authority. I don't think I have to tell you and go into all of the details of what's been happening here in our country the last few weeks. You can see it on your TV. You can see it on social media. But you know, as I sit there and look at my screen, when I watch what's happening in the world, it can be easy for me to distance myself from the people I see as doing things that I don't really agree with. I'm tempted to fall into this mentality of me versus versus them. To think of those people over there as being somehow less deserving of God's love than I am. But now I want you to imagine for a moment that if God had looked at me like that, 
if God had looked at me and said to me, I'm only going to come to you, I'm only going to love you and save you, if you can perfectly line up your thinking with mine. Otherwise, you aren't worth my time. I wouldn't have stood a chance. And the thing is, God would have been completely right in doing just that. But what's amazing is, he didn't. Instead, God showed his unconditional love for us and created a plan to save. The Father sent his Son to become one of us. God became man and Jesus and came to live with us to know what it's like to face rejection and hardship, to face temptation and turn it away, to do everything the Father demanded. He did what we couldn't. And then God did to his perfect son what he would have been right to do to us. As Jesus was hanging there on the cross with the sins of the world on his back, God turned his back on his son. God separated himself from his son. So that you, me, everyone, we wouldn't have to face that kind of separation. So we could be forgiven of the punishment that sin deserves. And then, God put his name on you. At your baptism, when you were washed with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God put his full name on you. He adopted you into his family. Like a mother or father who adopt a child and give their last name to their new son or daughter, God's put his full name on you so that you can know that you belong to him. God the Father becomes your father. He brings you into his family. And that's possible because of what God the Son has done, paying the price that we couldn't pay ourselves. And God the Holy Spirit, he works to create faith in our hearts so that we can believe all of this is true and remind us again and again of all that God has done for us as we continue to learn and to grow in understanding just what great lengths our triune God has gone to make us a part of his family. And that name God has put on us, it reminds us that we don't belong to the world, but we belong to the triune God who created us, who brought us back from sin and brought us to faith. It reminds us that even when we stray away, when we sin, God still has his name on us. That name reminds us of who we are and what we have been called to do and how we have been called to live. Some of you maybe already know this, but I grew up the son of a pastor. And at one of the churches that my dad was at, it was in a very small town, probably only about 900 people. And so everyone in that town they knew who the pastor was. Whether they went to the church or not, they knew who the pastor was. And so by extension, they knew who the pastor's family was too. I guess you could say that as a little grade schooler, I had a name to live up to. And to this day, I can still remember one time very clearly when I didn't live up to that name. I was in kindergarten, And for whatever reason, at recess one day, I thought it would be a fun idea to convince one of my friends to throw rocks with me at cars across the street from the parking lot. So we stood there at the playground in the parking lot, uh, the whole recess, trying to hit cars that were parked across the street with rocks. And 
eventually we hit one of the cars. And it couldn't have been more than a second later when the playground supervisor came running up, and I can still remember this part crystal clear like it was yesterday. She came up and said, aren't you the pastor's son? I hadn't lived up to the name that I had. I was marked as different than the rest of my classmates. And as I went through the rest of the day, as I sat in the principal's office, I was thinking about what was going to happen when I finally got home. I was thinking about how my dad was going to react. I was so afraid that I even took the long way home. And when I finally did get home, well, yeah, there were some consequences. But I was still part of the family. My failure to live up to the name that I had didn't end up with me being thrown out. My dad still welcomed me back into the house. And I tell you, after that, I didn't throw rocks at cars anymore. And I learned more and more what it meant to be the son of the pastor. Brothers and sisters, God has put his name on you. That means that he's marked you as his own child. It means that when you fail to live up to that name, he's still going to be there to welcome you home. And it means that we're going to be different as we live in this world. We're going to continue to learn and grow in what it means to have his name on us. And as we learn and grow ourselves, we do what Jesus says. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. God gives you and me this op awesome opportunity to let others know and to teach them that every single person is a unique individual created by God the Father, who God the Father loves, who he knows, who he cares about, and he wants to know him too. Every single person is a blood-bought soul who Jesus went to the cross to die for. And he wants to see standing next to him someday in heaven. The Holy Spirit wants to work in the heart of everyone. You know, I keep finding myself asking what I should be doing right now with this tense situation that we have going on in our country. That's dividing so many people. I listen to one side, and they say to do this. I listen to the other, and they say do that. People are, rightly so, looking for ways to take action. So what do you and I, what do Christians do? Well, we do what Jesus says to us today. We go. We make disciples of all nations. We live and work like someone who has had God's name stamped on their back. Whether it's during time of pandemic or during times of protests, we see each person through the eyes of God's love and we seek to bring as many as possible into that family of God, going to them and making disciples, meeting them where they are in their struggles and, and listening to them and hearing what they have to say and then showing them, showing them this powerful message of the gospel that Jesus has given to us to share. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, Lord of the nations, look in mercy on our nation as we struggle with discord and civil unrest. You, O oh Lord, work righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Move the hearts of all people 
that the barriers which unjustly divide us may crumble, suspicions may disappear, and hatreds may cease. Heal our division that we might live in peace. Frustrate the plans of those who would stir up violence and strife, and bless the efforts of all who promote harmony and peace. Give to our leaders and all in authority a special measure of wisdom and patience as they carry out their tasks. Grant that justice may prevail throughout our land. Help us as Christian citizens to reflect your love in all we do. Let the preaching of your gospel, which alone can bring true peace to human hearts, be heard throughout our land. Hear us for the sake of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, our Savior. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. In a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to sing a hymn if you would like, but before we do that, I just want to thank you again for all of the prayers, uh, all of the support, the continued support that you all have shown for our congregation. It's truly been wonderful to see God working through all of you during these tense and unusual times. I also want to share some good news. Next week, June 14th, so next Sunday, we are going to have live, in-person worship. Uh, we're taking precautions. Uh, we're going to have people coming through, cleaning the church. Uh, we're, we're coming up with ways to make sure that we can meet, and as we meet, do it safely. So, for now, what uh, we need you to know is that next week, June 14th, there will be in-person worship. Uh, look for an email, uh, more information from Pastor, uh, laying out more of the details about what that's going to look like and, and what we should expect. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward so much to seeing uh, many of you again next week here in God's house where we can join together to praise our triune God.